So that's where I um, started dumping the materials for this uh, this course. I guess it will also appear on um, yeah on the Deep Learning Two website. Um, but yeah, here you have them in advance, so maybe indeed that's a nice thing. So this uh, first lecture consists of uh, six or seven parts. I'll see how far I can get. Um, so that will be six or seven separate PDFs on that website. Um, which you can use to annotate along. Um, yeah, so the technical challenge was here that I don't have access directly to the screen. So we have Zoom running there and there, and streaming to that one, and that cast to the screen. So it's a bit of a challenge, and that's why also this screen is a bit um, smaller, but I hope it's still uh, visible. Um, yeah, it's cool that you um, are following uh, this module. Um, so another note, to say on this website, there's also a link to a YouTube channel where I have this uh, videos. Uh, so in case I'll refer to them in case I don't finish all of it today, uh, but just, uh, it's also good to rewatch things, I guess, uh, at the later spot. Yeah, so this module is about group equivalent deep learning. And equivalence, as I'll explain um, today, is a property of a neural network that um, ensures that um, geometric quantities are preserved. For example, a convolutional net network that dominates uh, computer science, uh, computer vision, um, they're known to be translation equivalent, meaning that if you shift the image, the output shifts, and that allows for weight sharing, but it also allows for certain guarantees that you should, in theory, be capable of uh, detecting certain patterns, patterns regardless of their pose or uh, you know, shift within an image. So through this equivalence constraint, we can ensure certain properties. And this is uh, important in many aspects. So I will go over that. But first, let's sketch an overview of, of lecture one. So I'll sketch a bit uh, the importance of group equivalent deep learning. Then I'll go over the basics of group theory. So uh, in this module, we have several sections of which are more fundamental or let's say mathematical preliminaries, let's say, things that you really need to know to understand things in depth. Uh, so Martin and Red. So today a bit of group theory and maybe the basics of group theory. And if I get to it, a bit more on the homogeneous uh, spaces. Um, and based on this theoretical 1.2, we can already understand and build group convolutional neural networks. So weight sharing, that means weight sharing, not just over translation, but also over rotations, other symmetry groups. Um, yeah, that will be covered today. And hopefully also I can say something about homogeneous spaces, which is a certain uh, class of function spaces or manifolds in which a group can act. And, and that allows us to generalize group convolutions in a nice framework and make the claim that if you want to build equivalent neural networks and group convolutions uh, are all you need. So that's a bit uh, the sketch of today. So when it comes to a motivation, um, so many tasks, and this is a, a, a task taken for medical imaging, if you want to, for example, classify or detect abnormal cells, and you train a deep neural network for it, which, which do a pretty decent job nowadays, um, you know, you want it to be classified as healthy, for example, this, this would be the case. But what if I rotate the sample and feed it to the neural network again? Will it still say that it's a healthy uh, sample? This is actually not guaranteed by these neural networks. And we often encounter that we actually see the opposite label pop up just by a mere rotation of this, uh, of, of this sample. And that's obviously not what you want, um, especially not in, in clinical practice. So a solution to this is data augmentation. Uh, it's typically done. So you create rotated samples, keep the target label the same, feed it to your neural network, such that it learns to be invariant to these kind of variations. Um, an issue with this is, of course, that you still do not have guarantees of invariance. Basically, you rely on the neural, neural network to learn these uh, symmetry properties that I see a rotated example. It has to learn, OK, this indeed belongs to the same class. It's almost like it sees new instances, but it does not really intrinsically learn to be invariant. So that's still, we don't have these guarantees. Um, another thing is that a lot of valuable network capacity is lost on learning these invariances. You want this neural network to learn patterns like, hey, is this healthy or pathological? But those are the important things that as that need to be performed. Uh, but now it also needs to be learned to be invariant to these transformations. So you're spending a lot of network uh, uh, weights 
on, on learning the property, whereas actually it's very well understood um, how to code this up. And that's what you'll see in, in today's lecture, uh, how to make sure that non do not have to learn these geometric properties that are equipped with them. And that we can focus on the development uh, patterns. So all in all, uh, we see that you get a lot of redundancy in feature representations. And I think, yeah, so this is a, a, a blog post from 2020 showing what kind of symmetries are there in these, these weights and these learned convolution kernels. And what you see is a lot of convolution kernels look like, like exactly the same, but just rotated copies from one another. So that shows actually that there's a lot of redundancy in this data set. So why not bake in the symmetry that you only learn one canonical representation and then make, let's say, a filter bank out of it of its transformed rotated copies. Um, that's, that's in some sense the essence of what we're going to see uh, today. Um, so that, that's a bit about invariance. It's like, uh, if the input changes, we want the output to stay the same. But then there's maybe an even more important notion that's called equivariance. So an equivariance basically means that if the input translates, for example, with convolutions, I'm going to now play this animation, and the input shifts, the output shifts accordingly, right? So this is called equivariance. So a predictable behavior of the output relative to transformation of the input. And this is even more important than uh, the invariance property because equivariance guarantees that no information gets lost. It's just shifted to different location in space. So if this process, the edge is detected over here, I shift the input, I still detected those edges, it just shifted to different locations in space. So that's an important aspect of equivariance. Now, the issue is that with standard CNNs, we have translational equivariance, but not rotational. And as my, uh, you know, motivated before, we also want rotation in place. What you see over here is a rotated input. This is the, the output feature map, and this is the stabilized feature. Suppose we rotate it back, and then we get this thing, but we see that this activation state, it change all the time. So if we see like a, a flat or this building, sometimes it's, you know, uh, appearing in some feature pattern, sometimes it's disappearing. So we get kind of unstable features uh, in this case. But if we are able to ensure this equivariance, uh, we can ensure that it's very visible, but the, what you see is a vector field, so of directional features. Um, now we can guarantee with this equivalent scene is that if the input rotates, uh, the output rotates accordingly, as well as these feature vectors, right? So those can be thought of as, you know, uh, feature uh, like feature detectors, which have some orientation information in them. So we can plot them as, as a vector. And if I now rotate this back, you see it's completely stable. So this is now then what you would call a reliable feature detector when it comes to rotations. Yeah, so that's what we're going to learn how to build these group equivalent CNNs that are also rotation uh, equivalent. So in summary, like if the importance of equivalence is that no information gets lost when the input is transformed. And this actually guarantees stability to, um, to both local and global transformations. And what's actually most important is that uh, we now have a notion of weight sharing not just uh, of weight sharing, not just over uh, translation, but also over rotations. And this is a very powerful thing because you can really focus on core patterns. For example, in computer vision, you can think of um, maybe core features like edges or corners appearing all over the image at different locations, but also different orientations and different scales. So but ideally, we want to do weight sharing over all these kinds of transformations and variations of these, these patterns. And that's something that we can guarantee with that group equivalent uh, neural networks. Um, yeah, so this weight sharing also motivates that GCNs are not just important for guaranteeing invariance, that, that's often what we want. So uh, whatever the, the input pose is, we want the label to stay the same, but it's also important because of this equivalent. So in computer vision, we don't want to be able to see this image upside down or like and still be able to do a good job because we can assume in many cases like sort of fixed uh, horizon, uh, like a uh, certain orientation of the camera. Uh, so in that sense, the, the, the task of detecting or classifying images is not strictly, does not strictly require invariance, but we see that we still benefit from this weight sharing if we build everything equivalent from start to end, right? So um, that's important to realize that 
you cannot fix everything with data augmentation alone, which sort of focus on this in-brains aspect. Uh, but ideally, we want to also have weight sharing throughout the network. Yeah, then there's other tasks like um, maybe in physics or particle physics. So there's a lot of focus on AI for science, in which we want to speed up the computations of very heavy but very precise uh, mathematically sound uh, physics models of, let's say, uh, celestial bodies, like this embodied problem, um, or maybe like uh, model interactions between uh, molecules in a certain way. And this really requires strict equivalence. Like if I have a molecule and has certain properties, if I turn it upside down, it still has these properties. And if I have a system of particles with a certain uh, forces uh, asserted to them, um, if the system is rotated, it's still, you know, has, it's the same system uh, with the same kind of symmetries in it. So we see in the AI for science, this equivalence concern is actually a must. And that's what we're going to learn today, how, uh, like this, this, this module, how to uh, bake that into uh, the neural network. And uh, this is a bit of a personal motivation. Like I find this very interesting, the psychology of vision and how the visual system works. And then we also have a tendency to, um, to build up representations from lower level components. A bit like this uh, capsule map framework by, by Hinton et al, where we think of, um, we can sort of imagine like if we look at data in this and in a medical example, um, anatomies consist of local surfaces and these surfaces, they appear all over the place, right? They have a certain location, maybe you can also give them a scale attribute. And if you put them into a relative configuration of these surfaces, of these core building blocks, we create a tube. So there's an object constructed out of these lower level components. And if you put these tubes in relative position, and they also appear all over the place, right? In certain orientations and scale. And if you put them into a certain relative configuration like this, it creates a bifurcation and it's not a feature that could be relevant. So this kind of notion of placing things relative to each other, that's nicely modeled with group theory as we will uh, see later on. And that's, that nicely connects to this idea of recognition by components, uh, which is also a bit of a driving force beyond the caption but where you think, okay, I have a scene of parts with certain poses to them and now I want to sort of align them in, in order to infer what is the higher level uh, object that I'm uh, seeing. Yeah, then there's uh, symmetries in nature. Um, you know, people studying this and, and just being amazed by, by all these patterns that you see in nature, seemingly uh, random, or let's say, um, like, why does this happen, right? So we see this nice uh, protein structures with symmetries. Uh, we see these leaves, we see or, or organic uh, structures. And the answer to why do we see this is, I think it's nicely quoted by Chaitanya Yoshi. Um, like symmetries, symmetric structure need less information to encode and therefore are much likely to appear as a potential variation. So why do we see this in nature? Because they're basically more efficient. If we want to organize a plant like this, it's really great if you can just focus on a core cellular level and repeat this pattern of how to uh, grow and how to uh, maintain uh, this living being. And, and you know, that's really nicely expressed in all these examples uh, from nature. So symmetry is also a way of reducing, um, you know, the information needed to describe a uh, system. Yeah, okay, so those are uh, my motivations for like, your hand deep learning. Um, yeah, and I think we're now good to, to move to like, the first uh, theory part of us to actually learn about what are these uh, groups uh, in the first place. And if there are any questions, by the way, um, now or in the future, just uh, interrupt me because I'm, I'm running out of breath. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we'll move on to uh, group theory. And when I talk about uh, groups, and let's start off with, with this somewhat boring slides, I just want to make sure that you realize that indeed a group is a mathematical construct, an algebraic uh, construct, just like vector spaces. It's a formal notion. If I have two vectors in a vector space, I know how to add them together, and this gives me a new vector in this space. And we know how to scale vectors. But now uh, groups is somewhat similar, algebraic construct, but the group does not have like addition or scalar multiplication. It only has a group product. 
And so what, it, what is a group then? A group is a set of elements, which I know how to combine by this group product. It's a binary operator. It takes one element of the group, another element, and spits out a new element in the group. And that's called closure. This is a standard associativity. It is an identity element and an inverse element. And I think it's best to do, to show this with an example, um, make a bit more, more visual. Like, um, the translation group, that's a group that you've encountered many times. It's essentially, well, the vector space R2 with this plus operation. So I, we know how to add vectors and that gives me a new vector in the space. So essentially this already gives me a group structure. So, but uh, in order to keep things general, we, um, we organize it as, as follows. So we say, we try to write everything as a group product. So we use this dot uh, operators. We may omit it sometimes just have the product there, but we say one group element dot the other group element is defined as just adding their, you know, the factors, uh, the, the parameters that parameterize this translation. Um, and then therefore we also have an inverse, which is the, this negative factor. So if I apply G inverse to G, that will be X minus X. Um, so that will be zero. So zero will be the identity element in this case. So the translation group is a group. And again, um, this group structure, we are going to view it mostly as uh, from a transformation sense, like um, transformation groups. So we can think of it, okay, we have a group acting on this robot by translation by an amount of G. Then I apply another translation by amount of G prime, which brings me to this location. I might as well do this at once with a, a group transformation parameterized by the group product of these uh, two. And I think I should swap the order here because we first applied. Um, G and then uh, G prime. But uh, so you see, instead of uh, describing things in separate transformation, we might also do this at once with uh, you know, the transformation parameters, parameters obtained by the, by the group product. Now, in this case, uh, we don't really have a need for this group structure because we just add factors like we do as usual. But when we go to more interesting groups like rotations and translations, we can no longer treat this as a plain vector space. We really need to define how to concatenate these transformations. Because now, uh, okay, so what is the rotor translation group? Okay, <laughs> T missing. Um, also known as the special Euclidean motion group, so SE2. So that's when you see SE2, we should think of rotations and translations. So as a set, it consists of the space of translation vectors and rotation angles. Uh, we can think of different representation, but essentially a rotation matrix is denoted with SO2, but the 2D rotation matrix is only defined by one rotation angle. So we might as well write uh, the product of translation vectors and rotation angles. So that's the set structure. And then it has this group product, which tells us how to combine two group elements. So I have a translation and a rotation matrix, a translation and rotation matrix. And if I combine it together with the group product, I get a new translation which is a shift by X of the group acting on this one and a rotation of the original position. So we see some mixing going on with rotations and translations and the rotation angles, uh, they just add up. Uh, we also have an inverse group element added to this. In many cases, you don't have to remember these, these group products. Uh, so in these cases, it's somewhat simple to, to memorize, uh, but they've been worked out in many uh, cases. Um, yeah, you have a question? Uh, I'm just trying to like get intuition for how the semi-direct product works, basically. Like why you go, uh, yeah, and... yeah, so we have a semi-direct product and this is, a, this is what, what basically means is that we have a, a translation group, which we just saw on the previous slide, and we have a rotation group, which is just saying I have a rotation and rotation multiply them together gives me new rotation. So separately, those are groups, but then the translation plus rotation group also combines into a new group structure, but we have some mixing going on. We have the rotation part acting on the spatial part, and that's where the semi-direct product comes in, in place. And we know this with this, um, well, uh, fish kind of symbol, um, denoting that this SO2 group acts also on R2, not just on itself. And so we have this mixing going on. And the semi-direct group product stru structure. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we cannot just 
treat it as a vector space. I cannot just add rotation matrices together. Um, yeah, because it, you know that doesn't necessarily give me a new rotation matrix. Um, so okay, so to keep this single simple, we have a G representing a rotor translation of this robot, and I apply another rotor translation to it. It gives me this robot, and I might as well do this at once by a rotor translation obtained by these parameters. So uh, with a single transformation. Yeah. Is it again G prime times G, or is it now G prime? Yeah. Um, because we first apply G, first apply G, and then we apply G prime. It's like if um, the robot, um, usually we say, denotes we let the group act on this on the left side, uh, just like matrix vector multiplication, and then we apply another transformation, G prime. So um, yeah, so the order was a, a bit off in this slide. Yeah. Okay. So why do we go to this? Um, because now we can focus, we, we can write things just in terms of transformation. We can talk about transformation without having to write out these group products all, all the time. So, and that just makes things mathematically really convenient. And uh, it's really nice to get used to this um, uh, step of abstraction. So um, yeah, then we also have this idea of a, a matrix representation of a group element, because I already start, said here like, hey, I talk about translation and rotations, but then I switch to translations and rotation angles. So these are matrices, these are angles. So we can sort of be flexible on how we parameterize a group as long as we can are able to define the, a group product in terms of these this parametric form, uh, let's say. So uh, rotor translations, we can parameterize them as matrices. I think you learned this also in computer vision one, like affine coordinates and these kind of transformations. So we have now a rotor translation all described in one single matrix. And it still satisfies uh, the group product even in this form, and it just becomes matrix, matrix multiplication. So if it, this matrix acting on this matrix, you can write it down in this form where you still have a rotation matrix over here and a translation vector N01. Um, so this is one way to represent the group. Another way is to do this in parametric form. So we have a translation and rotation angle, and I want to stay in this representation. Um, well, this is the translation and the angle will be the sum of the two angles modulo uh, two pi, so we have this uh, repetition going on. So we're somewhat free in how to represent our, um, our uh, transformations. Yeah, maybe th this is just another example that we can also talk about translations and scalings. Um, and these are all instances of what you would call affine groups. So affine groups have this structure to them that they're a, a semi-direct product of translation with uh, you know, something that acts also on the spatial part in itself, like rotations act on spatial part, scalings act on the, the spatial part, uh, but also like distortions, like skew transformations. So there's all class of affine transformations of, you know, of which these previous examples are uh, special cases. So we have, let's say, a translation part and a subgroup, which I will know with H oftentimes, and this H acts on the spatial domain and it acts on, on itself. Um, yeah, just like in general, affine transformations uh, with matrix vector multiplication, maybe you've seen it in linear algebra, you have a matrix plus some bias term, that's essentially also a, um, an affine transformation. Um, yeah, so what I'm now going to do next is describe this psychology of vision or recognition by components viewpoint in terms of, of group uh, of, of the group structure. So in machine learning, we do a lot of pattern recognition and we define features or we let neural networks define features. So that, now let's think of how can we define a phase in terms of uh, group elements. So we do it as follows. So now we describe this in terms of the translation group. So we pick an origin, let's say, let's say the nose, and then relative to this nose, we have a bit to the up right, we have uh, an eye, to the up left, we have another eye, below we have a mouth, and around this we have uh, the contour of the face. So we can sort of build up a representation of a face by having, let's say, edge points without any orientation, but just a bunch of points relative to each other. And this is already useful in cell because now I have a phase described as a point cloud. 
And what if I want to move it to a different point of space to see what would a face look like at a different uh, location? I just multiply every point on the left with this group action, because that's just shifting things, that's applying a translate, translation to these points. And that shift this representation to a new location in space. And this is a really important thing of group theory. Um, because it relies on all these symmetries, once you know what a pattern looks like around the origin, you also know where how it looks like everywhere else in your space. So by just multiplying everything on the left with your group, you know, shift it around. Um, now let's say what how can we can describe maybe a phase in terms of rotor translation elements. So suppose now my core parts are oriented line segments, like contours, like small pieces of contours that have an orientation to them. Then we can also let the nose point in a certain orientation. And then we say, well, uh, at the up above right, at a certain orientation, we have this eyes uh, and another eye a mouth and the contour uh, like this. All right, so now we see a face as a, um, let's say a point cloud of, of local edge uh, segments. And if I want to know what this face look like, if I align the nose with this local orientation, I multiply everything on the left with this group element. So I describe my face in terms of rotor translation elements. And that also allows me to you know, move this, trans uh, this face around the space by just multiplying on the left with this group element. Um, yeah. But in practice, um, for example, in computer vision, I mean, there's a lot of cases where we actually work with point clouds on on groups or on, on uh, Euclidean spaces. But for example, in computer vision, we talk about functions or in images, right? A set of pixels. And so equally, we can think of these pixels as displacement factors, like translations relative to the nose with an assigned weight to it. So relative to the central part of your convolution kernel, I want to see an eye, so I make it dark. And so we have this relative configuration of points, but now with associated intensity values. So here we talked about a collection of poses of parts which form this whole object representation. Here we have something like a function. So I'm going to use this notation L2, which means square inter integrable function on the domain R2. Uh, so if you sample a kernel from this, I sample a continuous function on R2, which is assigned to re every relative position in intensity value. So it's assigned weights to relative poses. Now, if I want to transform this thing, I want to know what does it look like at another location, I multiply it by the group product. How do I do this for convolution kernels? You do this via so-called group representations. So we have a way of letting the group act on 2D functions, on 2D convolution kernels. So what I'm going to show now is a general definition of what a representation is. And then we go to some uh, specific instances. So we just, we already saw like, a, if we have a group, we also have a matrix representation of it. But th this can be a bit more abstract than that. So, uh, so we define a representation of a group as uh, a function that takes as input, or that is parameterized by uh, the group itself. And this is a general linear transformation on a vector space. Um, so, okay, let, let's make it a bit more explicit. So suppose we have a vector. We can transform it via representation of the group. So we denote it with rho, like the alpha representation, which is parameterized by this group element. Uh, and this gives me a new vector. Uh, and this is not an element of the group, right? So this is important to realize a group uh, can act on other type of objects, like functions, vectors. Um, and so not necessarily on itself, but it's still follows this group structure. That's why we call it a homomorphism. So it still has the same group structure. And that's as follows. So I have this transformed vector. Then I apply the group representation again. So a transformation on this newly obtained vector. This gives me this new vector. So I transformed vector via row. I transformed it again with row, but now parameterized with G prime. And it gives me this vector. And again, also here, I can do this at once by the representation that is parameterized by the group product of uh, G and, and G prime. So um, the group representation still follows this group structure. And therefore, we can sort of think of it as being one and the same group, a homomorphism of, of the original uh, group. Um, so then this, so this is a somewhat general uh, definition of a representation. A representation of special cases, which um, we're going to see a lot. So when we deal with functions on a space, 
and we have the group that is able to act on the space. This induces a, a, a what we call a left regular representation. So um, yeah, if you have a function f uh, transformed by the group, I just transform its domain by the inverse of group element. And this might also be something that you learn with uh, in computer vision. So uh, let's go over an example again. So again, we have a function on the space of square integrable functions on R2, so just a 2D function. Um, on R2, we have the group G, rotor translations, and we know how the group acts on the plane R2, right, by this shift and rotation. Um, so if we have a function on R2, we also know how to transform this function, so we just transform its domain. Um, so yeah, yeah, so that looks like this. If I have an image, I can transform it via the left regular representation, parameterized by some group elements, some rotor translation gives me this a rotor translated smiley face. Do it again, gives me this one. And it's a group uh, representation, so I know that there also exists a direct transformation uh, based on the concatenation or the screw product of these uh, G and G prime. Um, yeah. And so I think this is the final bit of terminology. So we talk about the group products, talk about group representations, and these are all instances what we refer to as group action. So the group acts on another object. It can act on itself, it can act on a factor, it can act on a, on a, on a function. So we denoted the group product with just this dot, group acts on another element of the group. Um, we have the left regular representation, the group acts on a function, try this L. And we might also occasionally use this notation to make a distinction between the group product and the group action on a Euclidean space. Um, in many cases, since they're all one and the same in some sense, it's all the group acting on a thing, we might omit all these symbols like dot or LG or O dot. And that's what you see in literature a lot. So there's a lot of freedom basically in how people write down this group structure. Uh, this is the simplest form, and therefore you see this also a lot. So be aware that you know there's different notations for uh, group product, and I'm not. I know I'm getting too used to to symbol overloading, but I prefer to be explicit on uh, the difference between the dot LG and uh, O dot because this this acts on a vector, this acts on a function, this acts on a group, and uh, from these symbols it might be clearer to you know to realize what objects you're dealing with. But this is obviously more uh, elegant in its, uh, uh, you know, written down form. Yeah. Um, I was trying to check out, like, understand the action on functions. Is the idea that you kind of like shift the domain of the function by the group? Like, like that you act on the entire domain of the function? So it would be like yeah. parameterizing a function f x, like f of x minus a or something would be like, shifting the whole function. Basically. Yeah, I think that that's what you should think of it indeed. If you want to rotate or let's say shift a function, yeah, you shift its domain and re-evaluate the function at this shifted locations. And that's what you see over here. I have a function which I can evaluate at all these locations x. And now I'm going to define a transformed function transformed by uh, the group action. So what I can, can do, I can, before I evaluate the function, I shift the coordinates that I want to sample to the new location, having g inverse acting on x. So indeed, this left regular representation should be thought of as transforming the domain and then re-evaluating uh, the function. Um, yeah, that's also how many uh, codes that deal with transformation. For example, Python has this function, I think, grid sample, and it also defined like this. You have a matrix acting on the domain, so you have to specify what this matrix looks like, and then uh, Python just does the interpolation for you. Uh, so that's a way of implementing group convolutions. And I think that's also what we're going to see in the tutorial actually on Thursday, uh, uh, this construct. Yeah, okay, now we can finally formalize um, the notion of equivariance. And again, I think I, I, know, I already used Rho for uh, representation, but I might uh, add this label to it, like this X, uh, again, to make sure that you understand that th this representation X on elements in the space X, like my input space, but I also, if I also have a representation acting on the output space, let's say this is the space of input images, and this is the kind of images that we can expect in the output. If we also have a representation on the output, denoted with this row superscript y, 
then um, uh, this operator could be a convolution layer is equivariant if it satisfies this commutating uh, constraint. So what does it mean? I can first transform the input, in this case, a shift of the input, then apply the convolution, it gives me a certain result, or I can decide to first convolve and then shift the output. And so this is called equivariance. And again, this is an important constraint because if equivariance is satisfied, then this means no information gets lost. It, you can always recover it. Like, uh, suppose you pull things to your neural network and wonder, okay, what, well, what if I, what if it was trans translated before I pulled it to, another, to the neural network? I can always shift those activations to, you know, what would have been the case um, if you were to have received a, a, a translated input. So that's equivalence. Um, yeah. Okay. Cool. That was like this uh, preliminary part. So we we talked about the group product. We saw different forms of representations, like matrix representations. Uh, we saw how to think of uh, objects in terms of relative group elements. And yeah, we talked about the left right rep representations in order to formalize this idea of invariance. Um, yeah, so I think I can make a start on what this actually looks like in practice once we're building group convolution with this. So let's do that and then I'll take a break uh, afterwards. Yeah, so uh, are there any questions right away on the previous part? Okay, then. Yeah, that's okay. Like maybe after. <laughs> okay, then, uh, okay, interrupt me if, if you see there. Yeah. Yeah. It's appropriate. So, um, so what we're going to talk about now is cross correlations or convolutions, because these are the building blocks of convolutional neural networks. So let's see what it looked like. Um, firstly, I want to make a remark that I talk about cross correlations instead of convolutions. Because technically, quite often what you see written down is a correlation, which means we have a kernel which is shifted to you know, a new location X and then take the inner product with its underlying signal. And with convolutions, you also have a mirroring in the convolution kernel happening there. And this reason is sometimes to choose for convolutions over correlations, but I like the cross-correlation viewpoint because precisely we have then this template matching viewpoint. And I'm going to express this in terms of the representations that we just learned. So, Suppose we have a, a, a signal, an image, a feature map, F, and we have a convolution kernel. I want to know what is the response of this kernel at a certain location. It, it means like, okay, I'm going to shift. That's, um, we can also write a G here because I'm not talking about the translation group. So the output will be a function of the group or a function of these translation uh, vectors. So, this correlation operator looks like this. I'm going to shift my convolution kernel by an amount of g, or by an amount of x, and then match it with the underlying signal by an inner product. And this is again an inner product on square integral functions. Um, yeah, so this, wait, let's go back. So this inner product is basically this thing, right? Usually when you talk about factors, you say um, k transpose f, if these were to be factors, that's the sum for all the indices of k, i, f, i, right? Um, now we have continuous vectors, like infinite dimensional vectors, it's continuous signals. So I do not sum over the finite indices, but I sum over all uh, points in this domain, um, their product, right? So this is just writing down the inner product for uh, continuous functions. So this is what it then looks like. So we have a convolution kernel. This correlation operator, what does it do? It shifts this kernel, so this green block, over the image. And every time you align it and you take the products. And whenever it's aligned, you know, in a product is a similarity measure, right? It gives a high value if the underlying signal is the same, uh, negative if it's exactly the opposite. And that's what you see over here. So whenever this kernel is aligned with the underlying signal, we have a high activation and a low at other locations. So we have a feature detected, which is now matched over all translations. Um, so that's what we should think of it. The co cross correlation gives a feature map on the, the, the space on the group itself. For every translation, it gives an, an activation for how well does this uh, feature respond uh, to the background. And actually, this is might be a nice exercise to, to prove uh, at home, but given these representational form and the linearity of this inner product is actually kind of easy to show that the convolution operator is indeed 
uh, equivalent, which again to iterate that we translate the input, then pull it to the convolution or correlation. Um, it's the same as first pulling it to the correlation and then transforming. And both convolutions and correlation have the same equivalent property, by the way. That's also easy to, to show. But now it's also somewhat obvious that, of course, the, the translation or correlation operator is not equivalent to rotations because, um, well, we see well visually here, if we put it to the convolution operator, then rotate it, um, we get a different output than where we first do rotate it and then do the convolution. So <laughs> we don't have this commuting diagram per se. This only happens, by the way, if the convolution itself is rotationally symmetric. Um, but that, that's a detail which we might see later. And okay, it's also somewhat obvious why this doesn't work because in a definition of the correlation, we define it in terms of the representation of only the translation group. Uh, whereas now we talk about, okay, what if we have the rotation group acting on these images? Um, so this is that's a mismatch, and therefore it's also kind of obvious to, to then explore, okay, what if we then also decline the convolution operator in terms of um, rotations and translations? So that's yeah, the, the, the obvious extension that you would then want to try. So now we have a group of rotor translation parameters by translations and rotation angles. So the output of this operator will be a function on the group, no longer on the 2D plane. Uh, the definition is still exactly the same. We have a kernel, which we match with the underlying signal by rotor translating it. So this, again, this is a nice property of affine groups is that we can split it into the subgroup parts or the rotation or the scaling or whatever you're dealing with and followed by translation. So this is also how we implement it. So this left regular representation of rotor translation acting on the kernel look like this. We have a rotation and a, a translation. And that's also how we implement this usually. We have a kernel. So we first let the rotation operator rotate this thing. Then we translate it over our image. And whenever we have a match, whenever this line matches with the underlying signal, we get a high response here denoted with this dark block. Right? So it's still template matching, but now we're not only matching this line feature detector for translations, but also for rotations. So this creates a feature map with activations that says, hey, here I have a line detected at this position and at this orientation. Um, yeah, and the result will then therefore also be like a function on the full group for all these transformational poses, you have an activation. So whereas the input was a 2D feature map, the output is now a three-dimensional uh, uh, feature map. Yeah, so now we can also show equivalence for these kind of operators. Here I emitted the translation part and see, okay, what if I do this group convolution, it creates this feature map, and then rotate it, um, or first rotate it, and then uh, do the convolution. And we see that there exists a representation on this high dimensional space on, on the group, because obviously we have a uh, group, you know, these are, these are functions on the group themselves. And we know how these uh, transform we know how the domain of this group transformed by simply the group product. So we know what is the induced left regular representation of rotation on this, this kind of function. It looked like this. Um, so here you can sort of recognize that the smiley face or the nose at a certain orientation, and then the contour, you know, it smoothly increases its orientation when I uh, make this round. Now, if I rotate the signal, the orientation of the nose Changes. So it shifts upwards because they have now this new axis which encodes for rotation. So we have this shift along this new axis, but we still have this rotation in the plane. So we have the shift twist going on. Um, and that is what the representation of the, the rotation group on SE2 looks like uh, a shift along this subgroup rotation axis and it <laughs> of this rotation also on the plane. Um, yeah, so this means that we need, if I rotate the input, all the information stays within the feature maps. It's just shifted around uh, to new locations. And you can derive uh, what this operation looked like by taking a look at what are these left regular representations. And now, obviously, now we deal with functions on SE2, uh, so these 3D volumes, and we also want to do convolutions on those. And again, exactly the same construct. So we have a kernel or template, which we're going to match on these SE2 signals by roto translating. And we know how to rotate the kernel. That's this shift twist uh, that you see over here. 
So that's why we're also going to go at the kernel and we're going to translate it. So it looks like this. We have the, our kernel here as a, depicted as a 3D kernel, which is able to, to pick up on patterns in terms of relative positions and relative orientations, right? So that's uh, the part whole hierarchy that we saw before. So it's assigned weights relative to a certain orientation of the pose. Um, yeah, so I didn't have the full animation of translating, but you can imagine once you test for a certain translation, you're going to rotate this smiley face, this 3D representation. And whenever all these blobs align, whenever this nose, for example, aligned with uh, the picked up nose or line detector in the previous layer, you see a high response. So in the end, um, now in this three-dimensional space, we have two distinct blobs uh, relating to the two distinct faces at, on the, in the input space. Both have a different location in space. So that's the X, Y coordinate. And they have a different orientation. So you see that this blob shows up in a higher layer. Um, yeah, so this is the idea about group convolution neural networks. Um, I think it's simply seen as template matching uh, on the group. So we have a kernel that we match and learn uh, with, with the background. Yeah, and also here we have this commutation diagram uh, working. So we have these three instances uh, shown. Um, I talked about the cross correlation operator, which is a group convolution, but only when it comes to translation. So it's defined in terms of the representation of the translation group. We have what we often refer to as a lifting convolution or a lifting correlation because it lifts to the input images to uh, feature maps that live on the full group. So now we added an access uh, to our feature maps and we have the full group convolutions. Um, yeah. So let's then what the typical structure of a group convolution neural network looks like. So we have an input, lifting layer, group convolution layer. And in the end, if we're not interested in precise orientations, we apply a projection layer. And uh, let, let me explain it. So we have for example, an image which is composed of these low level patterns. Uh, here, you know, stylized, of course, with these uh, colored factors. And we have this feature detector, like an edge detector, check color code. If I rotate it, uh, you know, it picks up all rotated copies of these patterns and sorts them around, uh, you know, along this new, newly added axis. So now we have feature maps that assign activation for relative group actions. Now we have, then we have can apply group convolution kernels and these kernels do not only focus on uh, picking up patterns in relative spatial configurations, which you have in 2D convolution, but also uh, the relative orientation is, is now important. Um, and this is a bit like if I have, um, yes, yeah, okay. Um, now, okay, now I'm not going to give this example. Right now. Um, and now we detected two, faces, let's say, or two features, higher level objects. And if I'm not interested in what orientation there are, if I only if I want to be invariant to the actual pose of this face, I can do a max pooling or some other pooling operation over this theta axis. Just like in computer vision, if you want a translation invariant classifier into your convolutions, and in the end you do a max pooling over the spatial domain. It's the same here, I can do a max pooling over this orientation axis. And that just says, okay, I saw a phase at this location. I no longer know which orientation it had because I did a max pooling over it. But uh, yeah, this is a way to turn these equivalent maps into invariant uh, things. Same principles, you can also reason about it in terms of scales or the transformation group, for example, phase as, uh, as you know, a collection of circles of different sizes. Um, yeah, and then, because this phase is bigger than this one, you can sort of also detect a phase uh, at this scale and at this scale equally well. So you have weight sharing over these phase pattern detectors. And if I'm not interested in the scale, I do a max pool. Um, yeah, so a summary of this is that uh, group convolution neural networks intuit intuitively perform template matching. Uh, that's a viewpoint which I like, uh, which is often somewhat missing in, in literature, and I think it helps to understand what do these convolutional networks uh, do. So essentially, a kernel, the template is transformed and then matched uh, with the underlying uh, signal. And you do this for a possible transformation in the groups, and that creates a higher dimensional feature map. Um, yeah, and then in these higher dimensional feature maps, we can again start detecting patterns in terms of relative poses uh, to each other. And now, where a pose also contains information relative on orientation. 
Yeah, so yeah, we have this wage sharing going on because of this experience, and we can improve invariance in the end through pooling. And this wage sharing is experience then that's essential, uh, you know, in order to be efficient in your representation learning because you only need to learn one core representation, and this is then matched for all symmetries. Um, yeah, in, in your data. Um, yeah, maybe I think this is a good moment to, to take a break. And then afterwards, what are we going to talk about? Oh, yeah, a practical example I applied this to in histopathology. So, uh, yeah, so let's take a break. Um, shall we start? Yeah, how long do you want to break? <laughs> is 10 minutes okay? Yeah, yeah okay, then see you today. So, 10 plus 9. <laughs> Yeah, and then you said like okay we parallelize uh representations with the contents. So yeah. I have to do that. So, with, the yeah, so that mathematically speaking, there's no reason to come up with a particular parameterization. You have a group and it satisfies the properties. Yeah, exactly. And it's all, all you need to know is that we can add these together with a group product. Mm -hmm. But if you want to actually compute things explicitly, now you need to represent your group of uh, elements in a certain way. Okay. And so if I talk about rotations, Sometimes it's convenient to represent it as rotation matrices. Okay. Um, but when you're coding this up, for example, yeah, the rotation matrix consists of these four uh, elements. It's actually only parameters by one uh, rotation angle. So when you code this up, it might be more efficient to just um, store this rotation angle. And then if it's I'm going to apply the rotation uh, matrix, matrix multiplication. I'm not doing this explicitly by doing this matrix matrix but just adding the rotation angles with modulo 2 pi. So we can either decide to work fully a matrix mode or in this rotation angle mode, which is just a different representation and different parameterization, let's say, of rotations. Okay. And um, the elements in the view. So, how do they relate to the, the framework that we were talking about? Like, we're taking the kernel, and then we have the, the other dimension yeah. in the, the feature map. Yeah. It's actually the angle you, you were talking about. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, what's going on here is that we have this kernel. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the kernel itself is a function of uh, x prime. So it's, it's a function of x prime. Now, if I want to rotate it, I now I know I do need this matrix form because I know it's still parameterized with just this t, uh, but it needs to act on this 2D vector. So, uh, yeah, so that's this rotation matrix. Acting on it, mm -hmm. and I also had the shift. Yeah, yeah. So this is actually also nice. Why you it might be convenient to parameterize translation in this form and not in the matrix form. Yeah, and then like x y and then x y y yeah. zero zero one because I don't need this full structure. I only need the sub component mm -hmm. which acts on the yeah. in this part. Yeah. 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 Um. So yeah. I mean, in full, in full, it's a rotor translation group with this symmetric product structure, and this nicely summarizes the group structure in the matrix form. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just, yeah, we can, might as well parameterize with just translation kind of this rotation. Uh, yeah. And uh, the translation can be just like shift five or something like that. So, uh, yeah. In, in either direction of the. Uh, Vector space, I guess. Yeah. Um, this yeah. is on 2D, right? This is on 2D. Is on 2D. And now we have. Um, yeah. And we have this pixelated convolution kernel. And we don't explicitly need to 
transform this kernel it says what the conf 2d operator for does for us right and this is an illustrator of conf 2d mm -hmm. um but if you want to really manually implement convolutions for example on point clouds we don't have this nice grid structure and we really have to explicitly transform the kernel and then take these inner products move to the next point mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um yeah then you need to know how to transform your convolution and in many cases you are able to yeah to, to parameterize this kernel as a continuous function so for example what's often done is let's say the kernel as a function of x that's parameterized with a, a neural network and mmp which takes its input the x and spits out the kernel values okay so now i have a continuous function which i can compute with and then if i need to implement a group completion i just need to yeah you know, um, first transform the coordinate that I want to sample and then feed it to the yeah. Oh, okay. So practically, um, yeah, there's many ways to, yeah, because we talk about continuous transformations. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think less people have focused, or like group conclusions started off with only discrete yeah. 90 degree rotations, because then you don't have to do this interpolation and then we really need have this. Um, 2D conversion and I just rotating is just a permutation and it's easy to code up. Yeah, and, uh, yeah just switching it off and then you create your feature map. Exactly. So you have one core kernel, and let's say five by five and you create four copies of it. Yeah, exactly. And then tie up on each other and you basically get what yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. I mean, whereas with this you would maybe that in the one row, like what's the what's the reason you like by having this parameterization instead of like okay say we could specify like how much we want to just yeah. like move it around yeah like the kernel yeah, yeah. and now with group conversion with uh yeah we try to create this sort of thing but they do yeah why how is that different how how do they differ a little bit um in, in this first layer, the lifting the convolution yeah. is almost exactly yeah. the same. You create a filter bank yeah. of yeah. these rotated copies and then find the counts. Uh, but then in the subsequent layer, you need to remember that the newly added axis encodes for orientation. So I can visualize this as a one dimensional axis, but it could be a higher dimensional group, but still, what it does it mean? I'm going to store a response of a certain rotation along this. Index mm -hmm. different rotation on this index and that and that and I could even insert scales over there. So why did I apply a rotation and a scaling? I put it in this index. Mm -hmm. This is just because rotations is, is a one-dimensional group. I can nicely stick them on top of each other and that is one-dimensional continuous axis. Um, but now it's important to remember that the response corresponding to this index corresponds to a certain transformation, and that's when you code this up. You need to. Remember this because in the next layer, you're going to, uh, you know, shift this kernel also over this axis. So you need to remember if I'm going to match my kernel along, you know, the feature map obtained at a certain slice, uh, then I need to apply the corresponding transformation. Yeah, yeah. Ah, okay, okay, okay. So you need to remember yeah, yeah. what kind of transformation yeah, exactly. you use. Ah, uh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that makes more sense now. And when you estimate the parameters, uh, you would like to start, I guess maybe this is more practical, but do you start with some random values for it, or you, you sort of guess, I guess, the X and the theta? Um, now it's just like with uh, COM 2D, you, you parameterize your computer. So oh, what okay. the pattern looks like, mm -hmm. and then you match it over all the transformations, yeah, yeah, yeah. and that creates a full picture map. So you're not guessing. Oh, yeah, basically you probe it for every possible. Okay. 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 Yeah. But no, no. <laughs> but what is the disadvantage of GCNet? 
Um, compute, I would say, compute. because now um, you work before you had just these two dimensional feature maps. Now you create three dimensional feature maps, and um, so also when you do the integration, you are not only integrating over the two D plane, but also this rotation axis. Let's say so. There's more uh, computations to be done. You need less data, right? You need less data. That's what I'm going to show now. I think. Um, um, so and also at the same time, because you don't have this redundancy in feature representations, uh, you can do with less feature maps, uh, less channels, let's say, in a neural network. So there, yeah, there's ups and downs to this. Uh, but at this event, it is definitely computed. Um, it roughly, no, not that much, but let's say if you use test for 10 rotations, it becomes roughly 10 times slower than your baseline. And um, there's ways to, to make this more efficient, but yeah, it will definitely get slower. Yeah. Uh, the upside is that some applications definitely demand this kind of equivariance, and yeah, definitely you have to resort to these kind of techniques. And you see that a lot, there's a lot going on in AI for, for molecules and material science, and those, those are all based on equivariance uh, methods. Uh, yeah, so that's a price that we're happy to pay. Uh, Yeah, I can guess since everybody's back already, should, should we just continue? Um, um, Nathan, please repeat more about group theory and uh, uh, the notations and everything. Um, yeah, that's, uh, I'll try to take up a, a good reference uh, for this. Um, I have lecture notes on, on the web page, mm -hmm. which are basically written from what I'm sitting seeing now. So that's a good. Thing to check later on, maybe. Um, but yeah, I'll try to add uh, like a good reference to, to this web page as well. Yeah. But that's uh, the, uh, yeah, the challenge with this kind of because it's somewhat mathematically heavy, but it's mostly to formalize the things. And when you then look for mathematics book, yeah, they have a certain style to it, right? There's a lot of information, and it's really formal mathematics, which is sometimes hard to get through. So that's why I don't. Have any particular reference in mind? And I, I built this up by reading a lot of papers on Wikipedia, <laughs> essentially. Um, but yeah, I'll, I think I can come up with a nice guest source for this. Yeah. Okay, so let's go over an example of um, let's see, everybody is still recording. It's, it's important. Uh, oh, yeah, okay, cool. Um, yeah, so. An example of a GCNN at work. So the task here was we have the task of the mitotic cell detection. So cells that have some abnormality to them. Uh, so it's a binary classification problem. And we do really require invariance in this case because it's a medical application. We have a few data samples. Um, and obviously the, the impact of making wrong decision is kind of high. So um, we want to do a good job at this. So the situation now is that we built a group convolution following this standard recipe, and that looks as follows. So we start off with an input image. We have all these equivalent layers, so the lifting convolutions, the group convolutions, and in the end, because we're not interested in the translation part or the pose, let's say, we do max pooling over the orientation axis. Uh, and in this particular case, um, <clears throat> we didn't do any padding on the spatial axis, so that the, the feature map shrinks after each convolution data, right? Until there's only one pixel, and then for that pixel, a response for all the different orientations. That's what this uh, depicts. And then each block is one feature, uh, one pattern. Um, yeah, so in the end, we have one pixel. We have, let's say, how many are these? Eight, eight orientations. And then we have a bunch of features. Um, we do max pooling over this orientation axis, and that gives me only the response for that feature, regardless of its pose or orientation. And that we pull through a, a readout layer, like a fully connected MLP, to classify this feature vector into normal or mitotic. And the, the structure of such an architecture is that you start off with equivalent blocks. This means we have weight sharing going on, and we can guarantee that if the input rotates, all feature information stays within the network. It might just shift around by, by these representations. And this we then follow by a pooling or a projection layer. Uh, so we want to discard this rotation uh, aspect. So 
Uh, it's important that these pooling layers are permutation invariant. So it could be a max pooling, it could be a mean pooling, uh, it could be a set transformer, uh, whatever way of reducing this to a single scalar, um, which discusses rotation information. Yeah, and then we we oh, sorry we finish it off with this uh, readout layer. And because this thing is not invariant, we can do whatever we want on this part and everything but follows will remain invariant. Um, yeah, this may be a bit hard to see what, what's going on here, <laughs> but we have an image and we have a convolution kernel. So this was an actual learned convolution kernel. So it picks up these bright pinkish uh, patterns at a certain orientation. And during training, you know, in the forward phase, we create a filter bank of rotated copies of these convolution kernels. So we rotate this kernel, stack them on top of each other, and then do a conf2d uh, to create, um, we have to do some reshaping, but in the end, we get a feature map for every position and every rotation angle, we got a response. For example, this filter picked up this, uh, this pattern and it appears at the top of the stack. Um, yeah, then we continue doing group convolution, but now with interactions also between orientation channels, not just spatial patterns, uh, but also like relative to the central location, I want to see a feature at this position and at this orientation, that's what it says. Uh, and we shrink the positional axis because we do not uh, do any padding. In the end, we have only one pixel left. And then for every orientation, we have a certain feature response. And now I plot the different features, uh, well, from left to right. Now, if I were to apply rotation on the input, and again, <laughs> sorry for this, so this is another notation for a representation. In the past, I used UG for the left regular representation on 2D images in LG for, uh, for uh, the SE2 feature maps. But anyway, if I have a rotated version of this input, this filter bank still picks up all the patterns that this bank did. It just shifted to different location, whereas this feature vector or this kernel now picked up this pattern and appeared at the top of the stack. Now the same pattern is picked up by the rotated version. So it just ends up in a different location in, in your feature map. So no information is lost. Uh, yeah, we continue that through a convolutional network. And you see that these feature vectors um, are essentially the same, it's just that information is shifted to a different orientation uh, channel. But if you do max pooling over this, we get a completely identical uh, feature vectors. So this shows that this convolutional neural network is truly uh, invariant. Uh, and that's nice because now we can let a convolution, like a readout MLP, take this feature vectors input and spit out the classification uh, uh, label. So that's what we did. Um, we tried different discretizations of the rotation axis. Um, so we also compared the data augmentation, right? Because that's a sensible baseline. Um, so what you see on the left, so this is NS1, that means no rotation, and that's essentially a, a conf2D then. Uh, so, and along this dashed line, on the left, we have augmentations. So this is a 2D CNN with data augmentation. And everything on the right-hand side is without data augmentations, but with group convolutions, with certain discretizations of the rotation uh, group. So if you only lose one rotation, that means we essentially have 2D CNN, and it performs poorly. It doesn't generalize well. And it's precisely because we have a lot of rotated variations in our data. So you see data augmentation is actually a good thing to do, right? If you want to handle invariances. But now if we turn on uh, the group structure, so we sample more rotations in our convolutions, uh, we see we start getting on par with the data augmentation. And at some point we quite significantly outperform um, you know, the, the 2D CNN without doing any data augmentation. So that we do not do data augmentations to confirm that indeed we learn to be invariant. Um, yeah, and that's what you see over here. So it's become quite better. And that's a pattern that we, uh, maybe another important remark here is by the way, that we constrain all of these networks to have the same amount of weights. So I think in this case, they all have like 200,000 uh, learnable parameters. And you can imagine if you, increase the discretization, then you have a, a 3D convolution kernel that needs to assign weights to spatial, but also angular points. So we have basically more weights to, the kernels are and need more weights to be parameterized. Um, there are solutions to this, so, so for weight time in the kernel, but this is naively what we did. That means if I were to pick N is 1000, I need essentially 1000 more weights in my neural network. And therefore what we did, we constrained the number of channels uh, you know, we reduce that in these cases. So this is a network that 
I can recall, but maybe only has 32 channels and this one at 128 channels or something like that. Um, so in order to make a fair comparison of that one. And let's also explain why we then see a drop if you move to MS16. If you increase the discretization too finely, then we need to also assign weights to this and we reduce the number of channels. So at some point, yeah, um, you want to sort of detect everything with one single convolution group. And so that's a bit nonsensical also, um, because we use five by five kernels, and there's no point in rotating if it's such a small kernel with only a small degree, it will barely make a difference, right? So you're completely um, over parameterizing your, your convolution kernels. Uh, so these are things to consider. Um, and often there's one optimum of your discretization that, that works well. Um, yeah. Then we also tested um, how stable is it actually to, to these geometric transformations. So we have an input image. Uh, we're going to pull it through the classifier, it spits out the label. Then we're going to rotate it a bit. And then we're going to check what is the response of this rotated input. And we plot that in this uh, sort of circle of plot. So for every orientation, we sample what is uh, the probability. Um, so let's take, a, let's take a look at green. So the canonical orientation spits, spits out this mycotic. Then we rotate it a bit, and then it says uh, it's healthy. Then we rotate a bit, it's, it's mitotic, and then it says it's healthy again. So it, it has this shape with these dips in it. Sometimes it says it's one class, sometimes it says uh, the other. Um, and then we plotted also two types of group convolutions, one with a low resolution and one with a high resolution. And the one with the high resolution, that is red line. So basically always gives the same class label for all rotated samples. So it's stable under these rotations. Um, there are some degenerate cases um, because still what we're dealing with here are numerical implementation of group convolutions. So there's always ways of a neural network to pick up on you know, uh, biases when it comes to alignment and interpolation artifacts. But generally, we see it's pretty stable when it comes to groups and rotations, except for this case. But then even the, the, the baseline is completely uh, random. Um, yeah, so uh, I think we can make the claim that this group equivalent neural networks are robust to input uh, distortions. Then I also mentioned, like, we have a lot of weight sharing going on, so we can also be more data efficient because the neural network does not need to learn uh, a certain pattern for every possible rotations. If it learns one canonical representation for a sample like this, then it doesn't need to uh, learn its rotated copies. And we actually see that, that GC nets are more sample efficient. Um, not just in the medical domain, we have some examples for that, but um, I think last year, maybe already two years ago, there was a nice paper uh, by Tess Schmidt showing, showing this in material science, where also there, um, yeah, you can do it way, way, way less data than um, what you have in the classical case. So let me go to this figure. Um, just going to check again what was, um, oh yeah, okay. So the colors are the data regime. So, sorry, the, the, the red color is using 100% of the data. The purple color means we only use 10% to train our data set. And then these are the different versions, the different discretizations. Um, maybe this is a nice, this is the optimal NS8 number of rotation sample. Um, so what we see, if we train with all data, so 100% of the data, that's a red arrow. You see, there is some variance on this. because well, Neural networks, yeah, it, it, they do train stochastically. Um, but yeah, we have sort of like this performance. And what we see that if we only train with say 25% of the data, we end up somewhere over there. So these group convolutions, they already with 25% of training data outperform the CNNs uh, trained with data augmentation on um, you know 100% of the data. So they're more data efficient. Yeah, we tried this for different tasks and we generally see that um, when it comes to segmentation, but also classification, these GC nets work really, really well when you have to deal with elongated structures, so with vessels or cell boundaries, uh, GC nets quite strongly outperform. And in other tasks, in, for example, computer vision, yeah, you have so much data that the we don't 
always see the tastiness, well, at least from on par, but uh, in case where you have low data, um, where you have these challenging problems with fine line structures, tastiness significantly outperform uh, CNN baselines. But if you train on ImageNet, for example, I think it might be that it might not be worth the investment of going to group convolutions. Um, and there's actually papers showing that if you have vision transformers, that they actually learn some kind of equivalent properties because you have so much data and this, you know, the statistics, data statistics themselves sort of induce equivariance. And uh, yeah, so that's maybe an interesting uh, remark. Yeah, so previously it was all about rotations. I also tested this on scale. Um, for example, uh, landmark <coughs> detection in faces. And well, then you have a lot of scale variation, right? If someone in the front of the camera or in the back. Um, we also put it into perspective relative several versions of data augmentations. And we saw that we could indeed improve upon 2D CNS with a GCNS by uh, quite a bit. In the case of mild excel detection, why would you not want uh, scale equivalence? Because I guess like <clears throat> they do well change the scale quite a bit. Um, yeah, that's actually, uh, let's see, there was a paper that does something with scale equipment and it did improve, but I was surprised by this because these medical images are, are standardized. They always follow a precise resolution, like a pixel has a certain micrometers in size mm -hmm. and cells are, yeah, roughly always the same size. So uh, the scale variations are less present, though there are like biomarkers, uh, with certain tumor cells that they have bigger nuclei or uh, so there's things relating to size. But I think it's more, in this case, it's more beneficial to do weight sharing over translation and rotation, but not so much over scales. Um, yeah. But yeah, apparently it does work sometimes to also include scaling or group modulations. Yeah, and another paper, we apply this to audio data, where also you have this skill, you have pitch, right? So you have waveforms with certain lengths. And uh, if I speak with a high voice, I see similar patterns. Of, obviously, sound is very complicated, but if I speak with a low voice, and then the, the same patterns are there, but just shifted in scale in the frequency spectrum. So also, when it comes to audio, there's a lot of symmetries relating to scale, uh, dilation, uh, that can be leveraged, and that's what we did. It's uh, this work with uh, David Romero on, um, you know, have something like pitch invariant uh, audio uh, analysis. All right, so I'm a big fan of the GCNS, which you might have figured, uh, but I'm not the, <laughs> the only one. And there's a really a rich body of literature and it keeps expanding. Uh, it started off, um, you know, with just improving on CNAs by baking in these symmetries. Um, and now we see actually more and more uh, applications where equivalent is uh, an important construct. But generally what you see in this paper that equivalence is the right inductive bias, like you want to do this kind of weight sharing. And we obtain a performance case that cannot be obtained with data augmentation alone. And we have increased sample efficiency when it comes to more weight sharing. Um, yeah, and no geometric augmentations are necessary if the ge geometry is already included in, in the network. So next, I'm going to go a brief overview of what we've seen in GCNS um, so far. Um, let's see, yeah, are there any questions uh, until this point? Yeah, okay, then let's go over uh, a little bit of history to put all of this in perspective. So obviously, when it comes to equivariance, uh, it has a rich history in, uh, in, in physics, for sure, but also in computer vision. Like classically, um, when we didn't, when we weren't able to rely on neural networks, we have to bake in sort of all the inductive biases the, that we have in geometry always, always pops up in, in this. So there's uh, all the literature talking about invariant feature descriptor on equivariant mappings and even steerable convolutions. Um, but in the perspective of neural networks, I think that the storyline was a bit like this. We had these neural networks, and at some point, uh, Jan Lecun et al. came up with this training via uh, CNNs. Uh, so that's essentially the first form of group convolutions in, in the neural network literature. But then the perspective of group convolution on that really kicked off by this paper by uh, Taku Cohen and here at the UVA, uh, where they built a group convolution for E4M, so that's um, 
yeah, that, that's what you call a wallpaper group. So there's four, 90 degree rotations and, and shifts. So a discrete group. Um, yes, it's this paper. Uh, oh, I think uh, in the videos, I can actually open up this paper, but I don't have a present. So maybe that's a good thing to, to check out later on. Um, maybe when we have time, we can still look at it or in one of the tutorials. But you'll see, yeah, you'll notice uh, in the paper they define group conclusion. Now you should be able to read it and interpret it uh, as such. But this is only on discrete groups. And they did this because if you have to code this up, you need to be able to transform a convolution kernel. And if you have like a three by three or five by five kernel, yeah, how do you rotate it? Yeah, you can use interpolation. Um, maybe you know that from computer vision, but if you only do 90 degree rotations, then it's just a permutation of the, the weights. So it's relatively easy to, to code up. So following this paper, there's a whole bunch of papers focusing on discrete groups. Um, because then actually you can also say I'm precisely equivalent to the group because no interpolation artifacts, it's just permutations and I really can guarantee every transformation within this group is uh, handled correctly. And people have done that for, um, yeah, for 3D symmetry groups of the cube. So we have all these right angle rotations of a cube, um, two different papers uh, side by side. Um, there's a nice paper that does this on a hexagonal grid, which is kind of cool because now you cannot just do the four, 90 degree rotations, but also the, the what's it, uh, like two by over six uh, rotations. Um, and so that's more, yeah, so you can be equivalent to all these six rotations without compromising on interpolation artifacts. And this worked uh, really well. Um, and then there's this class also somewhat in the same time, focusing then on, okay, how can we generalize this to continuous groups, which, which rotations essentially are, uh, but also scaling and, and whatnot. And the idea often here is that, okay, this is how I approach this with interpolation. So I have a convolution kernel and I want to, well, this is figure clear. Yeah, so if you do bilinear interpolation and we rotate this, you say the output pixel is a linear combination of four of its input uh, pixels. So that's just a matrix factor multiplication, which can be easily coded up. And there's no optimized code in Torch also for this. So you can really easily rotate an input for any rotation, any transformation you wanted to do interpolation. Um, okay, this is one way to it. Um, but, but people, uh, maybe another thing which I uh, mentioned to you in the Q&A, we want to have a kernel on X, which we are able to transform. So we transform the input X, and then we need to re-evaluate this, this function value. And what I just showed, you can do this by interpolation, but you can also do this by saying, okay, let my kernel be parameterized by a neural network, a multi-layer perceptron. And I don't need to worry about interpolation. This is just a continuous function, which I can sample wherever I want. So, and so this is then parameters by set of weights. Um, so then also, if I need to evaluate the rotated kernel, I just first transform my coordinates uh, and then evaluate it in the MLP to obtain my translated or transformed rotated kernel. So there's several ways to, to handle uh, continuous kernels. Um, but then there's this, this work on stable convolution, but we show next week. Then these kernels are also continuous but they're put in a cert certain basis. So we have a weight assigned to each uh, basis function, uh, which is just an analytic function, which I can evaluate however I want. Um, yeah, and then my weights are stored in these, these Ws. So, um, because I need to represent my kernels in some discrete, in a vectorized form, right? I have a, a torch dot parameter is a vector of a certain dimension. In this case, it's a factor of uh, basis coefficient. So I'll explain that uh, next week in more detail how to actually code this up. So this is another way of representing your convolution kernels uh, compatible with your uh, machine. All right, so that's a class of uh, continuous convolution kernels, which I'll cover next week. This has the property that up to an initial um, sampling on the spatial grid, this is, almost perfectly equivalent. And in 3D cases, we can make this perfectly equivalent, but because the image data is living on a pixel grid, 
um, yeah, uh, at least in this aspect, it's you lose some um, equivalence because of well the discretization. But the idea is here that you um, utilize some sort of Fourier basis in which you have exact representations going on. Uh, if I have, uh, for example, uh, a, 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 an image on a grid, I can rotate it precisely for, by 90 degrees. But if I have a continuous description in the Fourier domain of this kernel, I can rotate this precisely via, uh, well, you have this Fourier shift uh, theorem by a, a representation acting on the Fourier coefficients. And that's something that we'll go into uh, next week. But just make sure that you can actually spit out nicely uh, vector fields, tensor fields that are precisely equivalent to uh, rotations. And there's some seminal papers in this direction. I think this one is really known in the computer vision domain, and this more generally in the machine learning field. And Maurice Weiler is about to graduate his thesis, and he wrote a whole book on you know, steel neural networks, uh, putting this in perspective of uh, fiber bundles, actually. Um, and Gabriel Cesar is the author, together with Maurice, on, of this E2 CNN library. So that's also what we're going to cover next week. So there's a lot of theory to it, but luckily by now there's also a lot of code which you can readily use to, to deploy your uh, GCNs uh, for this. Yeah, and when it comes to point clouds and certain, at first time maybe seemingly exotic applications, uh, you don't want to work with signals alone, but with the point clouds or maybe state spaces of um, dynamical systems. Uh, if you have Hamilton Jacobi equations, there's certain symmetries in it. Or uh, So we encounter symmetries in physics uh, a lot of time. And that requires maybe also to consider groups other than just rotation of translations. So, and then we talk about D groups. And D groups is a class of groups which are continuous. Um, yeah, maybe that's a continuous differential uh, group. So a group is a set together with the binary operator. And if the set it has a manifold structure to it, um, in the group, we can call them a league group. And this has nice properties. And we can use traits to generalize all of this in a convenient ways. Exactly. Uh, league groups. Okay, some the logarithmic uh, map. So that's things what, what I also did in the past. And finally, there's now effort on generalizing this to things that cannot be globally parameterized um, via a group structure. Um, yeah, how do you do explain this? Okay, maybe it's best if I explain it next week. The idea is um, so that if you deal with manifold data, for example, a shape, then locally you have a 2D plane, which where you can talk about rotations, but not globally, you can come up with a coordinate system to describe the same type of rotation. So you always have to act locally. And that introduces an idea of gauge uh, fields. And that's all, maybe I get to that next week as a point, but that's a generalization for the, of this to where you have weight sharing over more complex manifold like a torus or uh, uh, whatnot. Oh, yeah, okay, so that's uh, this visualization, uh, like a Mobius strip. We can also build equivalent neural networks now for Mobius strips and, <laughs> and other nice uh, data structures. Yeah. Um, Okay, this is an important uh, point that I want to make, that GCNs are really just neural networks with equivalence constraints to them. So in some sense, they are less expressive or, than the plain neural networks, because a neural network can represent any function you want. <laughs> um, but when you work with images, for example, you don't want the neural network to just mix up the pixel values because then you lose structure. I mean, a neural network could, in principle, learn the same mapping from uh, an input image to a cat label as a CNN would, but the CNN does this in a more efficient way. So if you want to fit neural network store data, we typically want to constrain the search space to only the sensible functions. Um, so that's what's happening with CNN. So CNNs limit the type of neural networks to only represent functions that are equivalent and are sensible. And that really greatly reduces your search space and promotes uh, generalizability. That's the same with GCNS. Basically, we say uh, we want to limit our neural networks to be strictly equivalent to also rotations because we think that's an important inductive bias. And therefore, we reduce the search space and we more easily end up in, in uh, uh, sensible solutions. Yeah, so the summary of that is we talk about in inductive biases, right? So we want to reduce the search space for neural networks to only uh, the sensible ones.
Um, and the final part of this lecture is the claim that group convolutions are all you need. And so we can formalize this in mathematics, but that requires a notion of homogeneous spaces, which I want to introduce to you uh, because it pops up in literature quite often. But the claim is that if you talk about linear maps, should says layers and neural networks, if you want to constrain it to be equivalent, then it just has to be a group convolution. There's no other way. So every linear map that is equivalent is a group convolution. All right. Um, what time is it? So yeah, we have about 10 minutes left. Yeah, that, that should be enough to give at least the intuitive background on homogeneous spaces. Um, yeah, are there any questions? Okay. So this is again back to uh, the core mathematics, like some uh, definitions, which I think are uh, good for you to, to know. Uh, well, because they, if you're interested in it, they, they pop up quite often. So we already talked about the group action. So the group action, so now we say we define it as such. As an operator that takes an element from the group and an element from the vector that it acts upon and it spits out a new vector, right? So if you have a point in space, we're going to denote the group X on the space of the space X by this uh, group action and moves it to a different point in space. And it follows this group structure that if I do this again, I can do this at once. Uh, I think also here. Oh, uh, no, now I put the prime up front. <laughs> okay. So yeah, so we can do this one. So it follows the group search, right? So that was the group action. Now, if this, there's a special type of action, which we call transitive action, which means that any point in space can be connected to another point in space by a group action. So that means if I pick, for example, some origin and I let the group act on this, I translate it, it brings me to another point in space. If I would have picked another translation, it brought me to this point in space. And the entire 2D plane, um, the entire 2D plane can be reached with just this group action by moving the origin around. So that's what we call a transitive action. The group acts transitively on R2, which means I can reach any other point with just picking one point and transforming it uh, via the group. SE2, so rotor, rotations and translation, also acts at transitivity on R2. So if I have, for example, local position and rotation, I can rotor translate it, brings me to this point. And I could have picked a different rotation, it brings me also to that point. So actually now there's multiple transformations that bring this chosen point to another point in space. Um, but the important part here is it acts transitively, which means I can still reach the entire plane R2 with just this group action. The group SO2, so that's a group of rotations, does not act transitively. Because if I have a certain point and I let the rotations act on it, so I rotate this point, I carry these things, which you call an orbit, an orbit of this point under the action of G. So that's the set of all points reached by letting the group act on X0. So it does not cover the full space. So I cannot reach any point with just rotation. So the group does not act transitively. I can pick another representative, creates a different orbit. And so what you see here in blue, that's what you call the orbit of the group. So we, yeah. Um, now, a homogeneous space is a space X on which a group G acts transitively. So when we talk about the homogeneous space, we also always have to talk also about the group to which we say the group acts transitively. Um, and when it comes to this convolutional template matching thing, this is of course important because if you want to be able to detect every pattern under every rotation, you want the group to be acting transitively on your entire domain. So it means that every part of a signal can be probed uh, via the action of this group. Um, yeah, okay, that's... Illustrated here, translations obviously extensively on the entire uh, to be plane. Uh, yeah, I wanted to say something about quotient structures. Yeah, maybe that, that's good. Um, so the idea is now we have a sphere and we can parameterize this with Euler angles. And Euler angles means if I pick for example, the North Pole, I can reach any point on the sphere by first rotating along the y-axis, then over the x-axis. It brings me to a point in space. 
But uh, I can also parameterize SO3 rotations with three rotation angles. So that's Euler angle representation of SO3, which means the rotation on the x axis, uh, so yeah, x axis, the y axis, and the z axis. And so if I let these three rotation angles act on you know, the point on the sphere, it can also reach any point in space. So now I have this beta gamma, this spherical Euler angles, and this sort of redundant alpha rotation, because if I now want to move a point over here, so there we are, over here to any other point of space, I can rotate over alpha, uh, but that doesn't really change the location on the sphere. So I added this extra radial axis for alpha, but the other parameters, beta and gamma, are important. So what I want to show with this, as a tree x transitively on the sphere, because it can reach any point on the sphere with these three rotation angles, but there's one rotation angle, this one, alpha, that doesn't do anything. So um, we say we have a whole set of rotations for all alpha that all point to the same point in the sphere, on the sphere. So we have a quotient structure that we say we have an equivalence class of group elements that all point to the same point on the sphere. And this creates a quotient structure. So we say, the rotation angle alpha is, is redundant. So all these rotations all point to the same point on the sphere. So we might as well represent in this case rotations with this, this cone instead of this uh, space shuttle because that's the symmetry to it. And we denote it as follows. So we say the sphere S2 is equivalent to the space of rotations SO3, uh, where we have an equivalence class of rotations in SO2, which are these alpha rotation angles. So you have this quotient structure. Um, yeah, so here again, this radial part uh, explains the alpha parameter and it doesn't change the location on the sphere. Um, then we have quotient spaces. Um, I can imagine that this may be a bit much, but it's good that you have your first encounter with this. So a quotient space, we can then define as a space of uh, co-sets. So we suppose you have a group element and a set of rotations around alpha. So this fiber, I can move this fiber to a different location in space by letting the group act on this. And this creates um, yeah, a partitioning of your whole space in, in these fibers. And so this will be a coset. Um, so the set H uh, multiplied on the left by D brings this fiber to this location. And all points in the set all point to the same base point on the sphere. And in that sense, indeed, this, we have a, and originally we have a space S2 points on the sphere. Now we have a space of cosets, SO3, SO2. So those are really sets, uh, but they're equivalent in some sense, right? So, and that's why we use often write S2 is equivalent to SO3, SO2. Um, now, this is something which shows up in bundle theory and fiber bundles. So we have a bundle of fibers where we have a notion of 2D rotations, but it's just when we associate it to the base space, we all think of these points as at the same. And when it comes to homogeneous spaces, such as the plane or the sphere, we can also always identify this uh, coset, this H, by taking a look at the stabilizer. And the stabilizer means we pick an origin, let's say this X0, and the stabilizer is the subgroup of all groups that are considered that leave this point the same. So the stabilizer of the group X0, so we have the group X0, are the set, oh, is the set of all, of all uh, group elements that leave this point unchanged. So I can pick this rotation, and these are the same. I can pick a different rotation, fix it the same. So a stabilizer F, it's a set that leaves this group the same. And so this, this sphere is in that sense a quotient space where H is given by the stabilizer of, well, this particular chosen uh, origin, then say the X axis. Um, yeah, I think it's just, you might or might not run into this, but this is important to realize then that a quotient space, so it's a space of sets, uh, is equivalent to a homogeneous space. And a homogeneous space can always be written in the form of a quotient space. And sometimes when you do your mathematical analysis, it's more convenient to, to do analysis on these, these sets 
and sometimes it's uh, well easier to do this on uh, the prioritization that you're dealing with. Um, yeah, this is an example from the lecture notes, which maybe you can recommend looking at, but this is basically saying if you want to pick an or a representative of the set, um, there's ways to do this by explicitly writing out what do these sets look like and what is the constant factor in this set. Uh, for example, if a yeah, no, uh, maybe it takes too much time to, to do this, but if you take an origin over here, so the zero vector and all rotations around the origin, and I create these cosets, then the constant factor is this x, and these are tildes uh, are always, you know, it's a full group of, of SODs. So you can always point to this coset by its base point x. And so that's that then defines a mapping between the cosets and the, the homogeneous space uh, Rd. Um, yeah, so the thing going from this is, so a homogeneous space is a space uh, on which a group G acts transitively. And uh, this is important because then we can reach any point in your space via the group action. And a homogeneous space can be identified with the quotient space, which puts some symmetry on the, the group. And maybe that, that's the important thing here, actually, the symmetry part. Is that suppose this is a convolution kernel, which has all these degrees of freedom and give me this complex shape. But if I want to stay on the sphere, then I can do my convolutions um, with this thing, but that creates a high dimensional feature map. But if I want to stay in the space, then I can put a constraint on my convolution kernel such that if I rotate with this rotation angle, the response does not change. So we can also take of these um, stabilizing groups as maybe putting a constraint on your convolution kernels that if your kernel satisfies this symmetry constraint, we always stay on the sphere and we don't have to work with high dimensional feature maps. And this is also what you see in um, 2D convolutions. Um, if you want to be invariant to rotations or equivalent to rotations with only 2D convolution, then this puts a constraint on the 2D convolution kernel. If it's isotropic, so if it has this rotational sub constraint in it, then we can guarantee that everything else stays equivariant. And this is what I formalized in 1.7, so that's the last part. Okay, so this end slide, the group conclusions are all you need, but it starts off. Um, okay, let, let me rush through this in a couple of minutes, but then maybe it's best if you want to learn more that, that you actually watch this video. So the idea is that if neural networks, um, based on this matrix vector multiplication. So linear mappings for, plus a bias term. And we're going to focus on these linear maps. Um, we know that if, if this is a one dimensional discrete signals signal, it's a matrix vector multiplication, but if we want to have this equivalence, we can also go this in, uh, you know, uh, convolution form. Like we have weight time, the output of this layer, that formed by these two, three points. Then we move to the next point, it's, Based on these three points. Um, now I want to show that um, the equivalent of these continuous signals and these linear maps. So in a discrete case, a linear map is a matrix vector multiplication. In a continuous case, if I have a continuous signal, the linear operator is this kernel operator. It looks a lot like matrix vector multiplication, right? If that's set up multiplying and then summing over uh, like a row vector multiplication we integrate over this slot of this two-dimensional kernel and this slot of uh, f of x. Um, so we want now this operator to be equivariant. And the theorem is as follows. So this kind of kernel operator is equivariant if and only if it is a one argument uh, kernel. Um, yeah, and that follows from the transitive uh, group action. And if my output feature map has this quotient structure to it, so if I want to be equivalent to rotations and translation, then this put, then we have a stabilizing stabilizer of a 2D point in the plane, which is the rotation group. So if we have this quotient structure, then uh, this imposes a kernel constraint, we have a convolution kernel. Um, so this theorem covers all of that. So that says if you want to be linear and equivalent, then this is the things that you need to satisfy. Then it follows that it's a convolution operator. And if I do not want to do this lifting convolution, well, then the price, price you pay is that you have to put a, a constraint in your kernel. Um, so 
I go over this this proof step by step. Um, yeah, and show some examples. This is the case indeed if I want to do a stay on 2D. So my homogeneous space is R2, but I'm interested in the group SC2. This puts um, like a quotient structure on every point. So at every point, I can have an equivalence class of rotations that I could have taken to reach that point. And that put, induces actually a constraint on your convolution curve. And with this constraint, yeah, we do have a precise uh, invariance. But if you do not want this constraint, um, and we pick an any arbitrary convolution kernel, yeah, then we don't have this unless, uh, you know, we work with a, uh, okay, sorry, too many animations. <laughs> yeah, then we need to work with the whole field to make and lift the function to the entire group. Um, because then uh, the output is the group itself and we don't have a closure structure and therefore also no constraint on the kernel. Um, yeah, and, I think I want to leave it with that. And in this respect, it's also like these convolution kernels, these equivalent GCNs are the most expressive class of equivalent networks if you do this lifting, because then you don't have any constraint on the kernel. So if you want to be equivalent and have a powerful neural network, then lift it to the group. But if you are low on computational resources, you can still be equivalent but constraint on 2D feature maps, but this puts a constraint. And oftentimes these scale methods scale very well because you you know, you limit the dimensionality. Um, and because they scale well, you could train more deeper networks and those can also be more powerful. So it's, it's I think, an important thing to, uh, to realize. So that's the conclusion of today. Uh, group convolutions are all you need. Yeah, thanks. Um, wait, yeah, maybe <laughs> any questions because I'm wrapping up and want to run with that. I have time, so, uh, yeah. Um, you said that like it was a few slides ago, but you said that like uh, GCNNs are CNNs with equivariance constraints. Yeah, but it's the weight sharing like a separate component to the equivariance. Like it seems like you kind of choose how the weights are shared according to the behavior of one group, and then choose the equivariance to reflect the behavior of another group. Or are they kind of, kind of like yeah, so for that? equivariance implies weight sharing because it means you use the same kernel over and over again. And this is in contrast with the fully connected MLB that says this output pixel is some combination of all input pixels, and then the next pixel is some combination of all these input pixels without any relation between how these mappings are shared. But in convolutions, yeah, you always talk about relative transformations. So this one argument convolution kernel. This convolution kernel always takes as input like a relative displacement, uh, like uh, the upper left uh, pixel. And then if we go to the next neighborhood, I also talk about the upper left uh, pixel. So this equivalence constraint, um, yeah, induces uh, equivalence uh, essentially. Um, and if you suppose you have weight sharing going on, does that imply equivalence? Um, that's not always the case. Um, yeah, I guess you come up with can come up with counter examples where you do some really weird form of weight sharing that does not satisfy equivalence. I cannot come up with it at the top of my head. Yeah. 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 Can you um, repeat again exactly the definition of the symbol, like the division? So SO3 uh, and SO2 equals to a square? Um, the, this, this quotient uh, structure? Uh, one, one of all, you know, in the same, yeah. Um, yeah, so usually you use this tilde and this slash. To have an equivalence class, so um, you have a group, and when you talk about cosets, you say there's an equivalence relation, and then formally you need to define if I have a point G1 and a point we say we then define G1 is equivalent to G2 if there exists, let's say, a group element H such that G2 is G1. On the right multiplied with h so this is how you would define quotient structures so you, so we have a full space of so three but we say many points can be considered equivalent like this fiber because they satisfy this equivalence relation and now in group theory we don't write this g slash tilde but we write g slash h um, because if the equivalent relation is defined by the subgroup H in this form. 
Um, and this is what you call a left coset. So we have a set H multiplied on the left with three groups, but you can also have right cosets. And this is sometimes denoted as H and then the other slash uh, G. Um, yeah, so this, yeah, that's actually a good question because this can be confusing and literal. And then you can also have double cosets, <laughs> um, which are also not uncommon, uh, but yeah, so that's a notation. Am I remembering right that you only get a group out of like you only get a quotient group if the left cosets and the right cosets are equivalent so, somehow? Um, like you have the, the normal sub group or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So oh, what does it mean? So you, there could be cases that the left and right cosets are uh, the same or equivalent. Uh, okay, I don't know precisely what 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 this means. Well, I'm just wondering, like what. Like, what's the point of H slash G? Because uh, if it's name. distinguishable from G slash H, then with the question. No, it's more like the, the, these are fibers. If I were to pick um, the left cosets, I'm oh, sorry, the right cosets, it's uh, this one. These are orbits. And um, because you have a point, and then you multiply it on the left to reach any other point in space. So that covers the full sphere. So that this right coset is definitely different from this fiber, this left coset, uh, okay. uh, this, this fiber. Yeah, then these cosets are all distinct fibers. And so depending on what kind of analysis you do, um, yeah, you make this distinction between uh, the left and right cosets. Um, yeah. 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 Usually, when you see something like this, it's they don't use this notation that much, but it's more a talk of orbits. Like uh, we have uh, a group H acting on some domain. Um, yeah, I can come up actually with an example uh, where this actually plays a role in solving the so-called kernel constraint. Maybe it pops up next week, uh, but I won't go into that deep in the discussion structure. But I think it's good that you you know at least uh, seen it once. Yeah. All right, then uh, let's leave it at this. And then next Thursday, so upcoming Thursday, uh, David Knigger will go to a tutorial notebook where we actually build neural network GCNS from scratch. <laughs>